All right. So it is high noon and uh, it's time to get going. Hey, I'm going to open with a word of prayer and then got just a couple of quick uh, announcements to make and then we'll be uh, off and running. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for today. Thanks for the chance to uh, be with Dr. Haupt. Thank you for his wisdom, for his insight, for all the amazing stuff that he's doing for the church. And uh, thank you that your church endures uh, because we don't have to worry about being in charge of it. Your son is. Thank you for all that he's done for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, this is the Isolation Bible Study. I'm Zach McIntosh. And today I have the esteemed pleasure of being joined by the Reverend Dr. Ben Haupt, and a couple of quick full disclosure things. Uh, number one, you and I are classmates, so we've known each other for a long time. Uh, <laughs> and that I'll admit true. that about you, whether or not you want to admit that about me is completely up to you. And we're not uh, going to tell any of those stories today, any right? Of those stories this is about the word of, of God. <laughs> it's about the word of God, none of, nothing about those old stories. Uh, but the other thing is that, so um, you and I went to the same seminary in St. Louis. You and I, I think, graduated the same year. And then uh, you uh, also wound up to, uh, to eventually get a PhD. And uh, you're now a professor of practical theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Did I, did I, did I get it. that right? I want to make right. sure I did. And uh, you also did quite a bit of work in patristics, which is basically a fancy way of saying there are a lot of ancient church wise guys literally very wise, who uh, give us a lot of insight even to what we're facing in the church today. And uh, so you're going to be drawn from a little bit of their insight to talk about some of the struggles and some of the fears and some of the concerns that uh, we face as a church even today. But before we get there, I do need to just do one quick housekeeping issue. Um, we are open for kind of limited on in-person worship at Concordia, on-campus worship at Concordia. But if you want to come to our service, uh, you need to register online because you just need to know how many folks are coming to make sure we can do all the appropriate social distancing stuff. And so you can register on our website by going to concordia.cc. And uh, pa Pastor Tucker will always say this. I'll say this too. If you're in what the CDC would define as a high-risk category, hey, online worship is worship. We'll stream at Saturday at 6, Sunday morning at 8, 9, 30, and 11, Sunday afternoon at 5. Uh, you can join us online as well, streaming on our Facebook page, uh, on the website too. So that's the housekeeping issue. Uh, got that out of the way. And so, Dr. Howe, take it away. Yeah, it's uh, it's so good to 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 be with you. Uh, you know, my my family and I, I'm, I'm married and have two boys uh, who are 9 and 13 and uh, throughout the, the stay at home, and now as, as things are opening back up a bit, but, but uh, on the other hand, still seeing a lot of, a lot of cases uh, and numbers going up, it's been an uncertain time. And yet, uh, as Christians, we've, we've uh, my family and I have tried to find a, a whole variety of different ways that we can uh, continue to share the word of God uh, with each other and also uh, than with uh, the congregation that we belong to here in St. Louis and, and with friends and, and family. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today is, uh, you know, in these times where we maybe can't make it to all the places where we would uh, typically used to hear the word of God and uh, be fed um, by, by pastors and such, uh, it's, it's all the more important that we're able to uh, continue to speak the word of God to one another uh, at home and to find so new ways of doing that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the early church and some things that I, I think were really important to them. Um, but I don't know, Zach, have you by any chance uh, heard about this new show called The Chosen, uh, which is a, a TV show that's produced a number of episodes uh, about the life of Jesus and kind of, uh, as far as I know, is, has been a pretty faithful adaptation of the story of Jesus uh, according to the, the apostolic uh, four gospel accounts. Have you, have you seen anything about that? So I have not seen any episodes. I have heard about it, and uh, the, all the reviews that I've heard uh, is that it is absolutely excellent. And uh, it's cool to see that kind of work being done even today because it kind of gives us a window into the heart and soul and center of, of, of our faith. Yeah, and it's come at a, a great time. So I would, I would, uh, I, 
I don't know that it's past doctrinal review of any sort, and I've certainly not even seen all the episodes. So I want to be a, a, a little kind of cautious or hedge my bets just a bit uh, with it. Um, but but it, I've, I've found it to be a, a wonderful adaptation, faithful to the scriptures. Uh, and yet they, it's kind of, it reminds me a lot of uh, Paul Meyer and some of the novels that he wrote around uh, this, the story of, of Christ and the apostles. And so it's, I would call it like Netflix binge worthy uh, uh, ab adaptation of the account of Jesus. Um, and he definitely, they definitely pull in some, some additional stuff, but um, I would highly recommend that. So find the chosen app and uh, then you can you can uh, begin watching those those episodes. So, for what it's worth, kind of interesting, uh, maybe for some of your your folks to check out. Uh, Which, by the way, one other thing, if it's kind of a faithful adaptation, speaking of speaking the word of God at home, that's one of those things where you can watch and discuss. And so, speaking the word of God at home doesn't need to be complicated. Doesn't need to be you know you don't need to have a PhD, uh, but you can indeed uh, uh, just just take some time to watch and reflect and learn because uh, the church has long been an advocate of the arts. Although I will say this, it's always helpful to have a PhD because you get all sorts of new insights. And so. Well, it, it was it was fun doing uh, some some study of the early church. And, and here's why I'm interested in the early church. Uh, a lot of people have talked about uh, how we're living in a, a new age for the church. You know, even when I grew up, uh, I grew up around all Christians. I grew up in the, the Lutheran church, baptized as an infant, and uh, went to went to Lutheran grade school, Lutheran high school, Lutheran college. So I was I was continually surrounded by Christians. Very easy for us to speak the word of God to one another. I was I constantly uh, heard the word as as I was growing up. Uh, but we, we don't live in that world today um, where basically everybody in, in the country is a Christian. Uh, I think we're all uh, readily aware that our country is changing rapidly and, um, and that there, there's uh, many more people now that are considered nuns, don't go to church. Um, the, the church has also lost some influence in the culture, and uh, certainly there are the, people do not always look first to the church to ask, uh, what should we do? What's allowed? What did the scripture say is the moral way to live? Um, and so and so people have called this, that say that we live in a post-Constantinian era. So here's what that means. Uh, Constantine was this uh, Roman emperor in, in 300s, right? Early 300s, who not only uh, legalized Christianity, but then even began to support it as the official a religion of Rome. And uh, before Constantine came along, Christianity was, uh, was, was illegal. Uh, people could not build uh, sanctuaries. That was, that was illegal. So they met in homes and, and sometimes in businesses. And uh, Christianity was very much a minority. And, it's, and it seems like in some ways we're going back to that. I'm not saying that, that, uh, I'm thrilled about that or that I want it to be that, certainly not. I, I owe that, that all people would know our Lord Jesus. Uh, but, but it seems like that's kind of the reality of our situation is that we're living more and more in a day in which the church is a minority, uh, where uh, a lot of congregations are, are struggling even to keep their doors open, to pay a pastor, um, uh, to keep services going. And uh, uh, so, so, people are starting to wonder, how do we as Christians live in such a challenging time where um, we, we feel kind of pressed in on every side? Uh, and this pandemic has just been one more thing uh, that has uh, been challenging for the church and uh, for meeting together and this sort of thing. And so um, I just want to go to a, a few things from the early church that I think are very helpful I'm doing a, a big workshop for pastors and some laity uh, later on in August, uh, where we're going to do a, a deep dive into the early church, the so-called pre-Constantinian uh, Christians and how they lived out. Because I'm confident that 
uh, as we look to them, uh, they, they not only survived as a church for 300 years prior to Constantine coming along and really propping up the church, but they really thrived uh, as, as a people of God, even as a minority, even among persecution. Um, and and uh, so, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in, uh, in learning from them. So, Zach, do you think that, did I, did I sum up uh, the question, what does it mean to live in a post-Constantinian age? Yeah, sense? absolutely. It, it, our, our cultural influence, there, there, there was a time, and there have been several books written about this, where there was a general assumption, right, uh, that if you were born, especially in the West, uh, you were going to uh, be born, be almost born a, as a Christian, or at least with um, culturally Christian assumptions. And so you would grow up with some type of conception that there is a God, and you would grow up with some type of conception uh, that, that Jesus is is really important. And interestingly enough, even if you didn't grow up with those specific assumptions, you would grow up with some assumptions that are endemic to kind of a, a what we might call a Christian worldview. So for example, you grow up with the assumption that um, there's something wrong with me and my goal in life is to be good. And so you, you know, you may have some evangelical preacher come along and say, well, here's the problem. You're not good, but guess what? Jesus is. And so Jesus can give his goodness to you. Well, all of those assumptions are beginning to, to give way. For example, you're, you're not born necessarily with this assumption that you inherit from your parents that it's your goal in life to be good. Uh, sometimes you're now born with more of an assumption that it's your goal in life to be fulfilled which is a very different assumption from kind of like the righteousness assumption that we may have had all of those years ago. And so as Christian cultural influence changes, uh, there are new questions that are being asked and there are new challenges that the church faces. One, one other way that I like to put it, uh, there used to be a time, especially in kind of mid-century America, where Christians had many of faces in high places. Well, a lot of those faces in high places uh, you don't see as many of those. Uh, there aren't as many what you might call Christian public intellectuals mm -hmm. who are writing for all sorts of mainstream magazines that everybody reads, because honestly, there are fewer and fewer of those that everybody reads. And so as the culture fractures, as people begin to, to kind of think in, in niche ways rather than in broad ways, we uh, Christianity's in influence, it's it's changing, and the assumptions that people are born with are changing, and so we got some hard questions to ask. Yeah, and I, I think you know, as a as a Christian, I, I, um, as I as I encounter struggles in my life, as we as we all watch um, the news, and it seems like uh, every day there's a new news story that uh, makes us kind of groan and say, "Has it really come to this?" Um, and it, it just seems like we get more and more of those kind of news stories. Um, and, and you begin to wonder, Christians, I think uh, this is very natural. Luther talked about uh, this is the, the whisperings of, of the enemy, of Satan himself. Uh, but you begin to wonder, is, is God, does God have it out for us or, or for me? Um, it, have, have I somehow gotten on the wrong side of God? Uh, that we're, we're going through this. Um, I, I also have, I have family members and uh, loved ones that uh, have wandered away from the church, and I, I grieve for, for them. And uh, it's, very, it's very easy for Christians then to begin to uh, think, oh my goodness, um, I've not been a good witness. I've, I've, I've failed uh, my family member, my loved one, um, as, as people walk away from the church. Um, and the, the question, I think that is just a fundamental question that all Christians continually grapple with and wrestle with is how do I stand with God? Um, uh, and that, that has to be where we start, um, and, and where we kind of, uh, return to every, each and every day. Luther said, this is, this is stuff worth returning to each and every day. So uh, if, if listeners uh, want to uh, join me in the scriptures, I want to take a look at a, a classic passage that, uh, that Lutherans have long loved, uh, which is in Romans chapter 3. So Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 21. 
these are these are um, critically important uh, verses for for us as Lutheran Christians, um, but but they've been held up uh, throughout the the years, and that's going to be my point. Uh, so Paul writes in Romans three, starting at verse twenty one. But now the righteousness of God has been man manifested apart from the law, though testified to by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, all have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. They are justified, and we're going to come back to that, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus. Um, the, the verses go on, and, and there's no good place to end in Romans because you can just keep reading. Uh, but but that, that simple word of justification uh, sounds like a big, scary theological word, uh, but, but to know that um, we are just, we are, we're upright, we're able to uh, stand before God confidently um, because he has justified us, not because of anything that we've done. And we simply trust him and the work that Christ did on our behalf. That's, that's where every day we have to start out our life. Uh, and, and whenever you have this, this nagging question that Satan himself is even whispering in your ear, uh, are you good with God? We return to the simple word from, from Paul uh, that we're justified by grace. So uh, just to put a fine point on this, just because we encounter trials doesn't mean that somehow God is automatically angry at us. So when you talk about that, I always think of, you know, the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, most famous sermon ever, Sermon on the Mount. How does he open it? He opens it with a series of blessings, but these are people who appear to, in a lot of ways, be unblessed. And, yeah. and yet, even those who struggle, right, even those who are poor in spirit, right, even those who mourn, even those who have all sorts of bad stuff happening to them that may make everyone else go, well, maybe God is against them, or maybe they think themselves, maybe God is against me. Jesus offers a simple reminder of blessing because it's not based on how good we are, but on how good God is. Absolutely. And, and um, so, so how this comes into the early church uh, some some scholars now now I, I put my my PhD hat on so I'm going to be a nerd for a second and uh, yes um, I I I will uh, keep this brief but some scholars have said well uh, the early Christians uh, in the first and second third century they lost sight of of justification by faith and uh, some people have even suggested that this understanding of Romans 3 that we just talked about, that's just a Lutheran thing. Uh, that's just for those Lutherans. Uh, who, Luther certainly made a, a big deal out of it, but, but this is a fundamentally important question. Uh, are our beliefs as Lutherans just Lutheran uh, uh, emphases, uh, or is this the bedrock of the faith throughout the generations? Luther and the Reformers made the argument that uh, justification by faith was the bedrock of, of uh, the Christian life, uh, and they said once that this is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. So if, if we think that uh, we somehow have to uh, do something to get through this, this pandemic uh, in order to get God to get on our side, to get it to end, um, or if we somehow have to save the church because of all the struggles that it's going through, we've lost the doctrine of justification. Um, the, the church, our faith, our being in Christ is all dependent on God's work. Uh, and so here's, here's one passage uh, or from uh, a guy named Clement of Rome uh, to come back to the, the point that you were just making about the struggles that we face in life are, is this because I've somehow gotten on God's bad side? Uh, Clement of Rome is uh, living in the, in the midst of uh, persecution. Uh, he's certainly uh, a way in the minority. Uh, less than 5% of, of uh, people in Rome were Christians at this time. And uh, here's, what, here's what Clement of Rome writes in about 100 AD. Uh, see if this uh, sounds a little bit like Romans 3. 
he, he writes this, all therefore were glorified and magnified, not through themselves or their own works. He's talking about uh, God's people here. Uh, were glorified and magnified, not through themselves or through their own works or the righteous actions they did, but through God's will. And so we, having been called through God's will in Christ Jesus, are not justified through ourselves or through our wisdom or understanding or piety or works which we've done in holiness of heart, but through faith by which the Almighty God has justified all who have existed from the beginning to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So in the early church, this was incredibly important that as, as Christians came up against really difficult things, as they faced people who, who ridiculed their faith and said, no, we, we don't want to have anything to do with uh, the church, um, that, that they would continually come back to this uh, simple doctrine, this simple teaching of justification by faith, that we're, we're good with God because of God's work in our life uh, and the work that, that Christ Jesus has done for us in his life and his death in his resurrection. Uh, so, so justification is this uh, big doctrine of the church, and we talk about it a lot, and people have written a lot of books about it, but at the end of the day, this is something that uh, helps us when we get out of bed in the morning to know um, God's on our side because of what God, God has done for us in, in Christ. You know, there's a temptation whenever we face a time like this, uh, try to pull almost a rabbit out of a hat and to say, what trick can I pull? What fancy thing can I do uh, to make this all better? What's going to be the next big thing? And honestly, the next big thing is really the greatest old thing. And so there's a, a non-Lutheran theologian, very famous story, and, and I'm pretty sure it's not apocryphal. It might be. A very famous story about a mid-century theologian named Karl Barth, and he was asked one time, hey, uh, so out of all your study, what, what have you learned? What, 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 what's the greatest insight you've gleaned? And uh, he responded with the words of Jesus loves me, this I know. He goes back to this idea that God is on his side. Another kind of interesting thing is uh, sometimes we do get into the sense that there was somehow um, some invention of this, of this doctrine that God is on our side, that, you know, justification by grace through faith, it, it wasn't always the heart and soul of, of, of the Christian message. One of the great things the reformers did so beautifully and so well, if you read, for example, through the Lutheran confessions, uh, you will see that they constantly quote some ancient church fathers with the express intent of saying, this is nothing new. The yeah. greatest thing is still the first thing. It's still the foundational thing. And it's not that we don't make new discoveries or speak about things in new and fresh ways, but if it's not built on the foundation of Christ and what he has done, uh, you're building out of stuff, uh, to use a metaphor from the Apostle Paul, that is ultimately going to not last. It's going to be destroyed. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was, I was listening to uh, uh, another a pastor outside of our, our Lutheran circles, uh, but his name is Tim Keller. He was a pastor in New York City and wrote a bunch of books. He, he, um, he was speaking on this topic, and uh, he, in a lot of ways, Tim Keller is very Lutheran in his, in his thinking, but it's only because this is scriptural. Um, it's not uh, anything that we Lutherans own. Uh, but, but Tim Keller was talking specifically about justification by faith and uh, the the continued belief in that in the early church. And he said uh, that ju justification by faith helps us in our witness. So as we talk to other people, uh, he said this, a justification by faith uh, helps us to be both bold and humble in our witness. Uh, we can be bold about uh, uh, God's work and, and uh, Christianity because it's not it's not work that we've done on our own to save ourselves. So we can be radically bold to say, you know what, uh, God in Christ uh, came down to this earth and and lived among us, uh, died our death, and and rose again to give us new life. And we can be radically bold and just um, we don't even have to ask people, uh, do you believe that or do you know where you're going to go uh, when you go to heaven someday? We can just tell them. 
a God in Christ came for you and he loves you and he, he desires a, a relationship with you and to forgive you. We can be radically bold and yet we can be humble. Uh, the great news is, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a sinner. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, keep myself on in, in this path of, of salvation. Um, in, in fact, I, I regularly stray away from it. Uh, so it's not me. It's not uh, us proclaiming, "Hey, look at look at me and all the great stuff I've done." Uh, if you if you if you ask my wife, she'll tell you about all the stuff I've done. Uh, she knows me well, and she knows my sins. Um, but but it's it's because of God's work in my life um, that I'm that I'm a Christian. That I can say, uh, "Yes, I believe in Jesus." Um, so so I think that's I think that's really helpful. Um, so, so, um, maybe a, another thing to, to think about, uh, and, and to turn to another theologian that I've been spending some time with, um, there's a, a big question, I think, for Christians now as society is shifting and changing and, and, uh, maybe becoming a little more hostile to the Christian faith. How do we, how do we participate in society? And, uh, uh, this, this guy, Hans-Joachim Ivant, uh, was, was a, a contemporary of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He started talking about, he, was, he lived during the time of Karl Barth, was, was very involved in uh, some of the conversations with, with Bonhoeffer and Barth. And he said, how do Christians go out into the world uh, in, as messed up as it is? He was thinking about uh, the, the World War II and, and all the bombings that had happened. And he said, we go out into society like Lazarus, uh, who had been raised from the dead. Uh, take a look at John 11. Uh, we go out with death behind us. In our baptism, we, were, uh, we, we died and we, we came back to life uh, through God's work. And so we go out into society uh, full of faith and confidence with death behind us. What do we have to fear? Uh, we belong to God. And uh, I think that's tremendously helpful for people that are trying to think through uh, how do we engage our neighbor or how do we get through this? Death is behind you, us. You know, one of the reasons that Christians can be tempted to retreat is because of fear and that, that um, realization that if Jesus has conquered death and if we have been joined with Jesus in his death, right, in the waters of baptism, if, if the resurrection belongs to us, then we really don't have anything to fear. Uh, that's something that if there's one thing that we need to remind ourselves of again and again and again, um, it is that. Because the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, to turn up the uncertainty, we actually don't know what's going to happen. And we don't know what the church is going to face going forward, uh, kind of like all the generations who have come before us didn't know what the church was going to face. Uh, you know, the church got some pretty tough awakenings in the time of World War II and with the Third Reich and with so many of the horrible travesties uh, that, 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 was going on, that were going on. And by God's grace, we won't be facing those again. But even if we do, uh, the story of Lazarus belongs to us. So... We have about two minutes. Any any quick closing thoughts? Any any final insights? Any other uh, church fathers or uh, uh, churchmen that we can learn learn from before we wrap up? I I would just say um, to my encouragement to to people is just um, to have kind of that bold confidence in Jesus that. Uh, you can speak the word of God to to your your family member, to your neighbor, to uh, a, a loved one across the country on a Zoom call. Uh, just 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 throw it out there, um, like like a, a a person sowing seeds. Uh, Jesus Jesus just flung the seed wherever, um, and and it'll grow if if it's if if uh, uh, it's meant to be. Um, God, God can do uh, great things with your words. So don't be, don't be afraid. Uh, speak the word of God. Share, share a Bible verse. Pick something out of the scriptures and just tell people. Uh, share the word of God. That, that would be the, the closing thought for the day. Thank you so much. I appreciate, again, you, you taking the time. Great to be with you. Hey, let's go ahead and wrap up with a word of, with a, with a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that uh, your word goes out and it touches hearts and it changes lives during this really difficult time where the temptation is to be afraid. Help us to remember that uh, because you go before us and because of what your son has done for us, uh, we have the promise that death is behind us. May we live with that boldness, also with that humility, knowing that it's not because of us that any of this has happened, but it's all because of your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. God bless you folks. Hope you have a great day. And uh, we'll see you for church this weekend and then on Monday at noon for the Isolation Bible Study. Thanks, Professor Howell. Great to be with you.